It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Hi everyone, my name is Nicholas Gonzalez. I'm the associate pastor here at St. Andrew. And on behalf of the Reverend Dr. Mark Rico, we're so thankful that you're joining us for our Sunday Word and Song, which includes our Sunday message, as well as a song from our traditional worship service, and some prayers and a blessing. If you want to learn more about the ministry of St. Andrew, head on over to our website, mystandrew.org, where you can learn about everything going on here at St. Andrew that happens by God's grace through all of you. We're currently in the season of Lent, and during Lent we have especially special worship service every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary where we're walking through a series together called Journeys in the Wilderness. And we'll be doing that on Wednesdays and on Sundays as well and of course our Monday evening worship service. So if you're looking to join us in person, you can join us on Sunday mornings at 8, 9.30 or 11 a.m. or Monday evenings at 7 p.m. and then for our Lenten midweek services with a soup supper at 6 o'clock followed by worship at 7. I pray a wonderful blessing on your Lenten season and I look forward to seeing you soon. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of Jesus, the Lamb of God. Amen. So one of the TV shows uh, that my wife really loves to watch, and she would even go as far to say is her favorite show, is one that might surprise you. And it's not because it's not a good show, but because of the era that it came out in. Uh, the show first premiered in 1951 and finished its final season in 1957. And there's well, lots of lines from the show that have been shared in other TV shows and movies over the years, but there's one show that sticks out to me, uh, one line that sticks out to me more than the rest. Lucy, I'm home. <laughs> yeah, uh, the classic I Love Lucy. Lauren loves this show, and part of the reason I know this is because we own all six DVDs, all six seasons on DVD. And a few months ago, we were talking about uh, what new show we were going to watch. And she said, I know you've never seen this, so give it a try. And so we did. And we watched a few episodes here and there. And I enjoyed it. I always had a good laugh. Uh, but as we watched some of the episodes, I began to get a little distracted and even a little disconnected from what was going on on the show. And it's really because of something I've never experienced before when watching TV. Uh, see, the thing that struck me while I was watching this show was that it was in black and white. And I want to clarify here, it's not because that it was in black and white that was really the disconnect, but rather because even though this TV show was in black and white, everything else around was in color. The characters, the people themselves were happening in color, but watching it in black and white and seeing the world around me then in color was just kind of a disconnected experience. Partially, of course, because I've watched TV my whole life and everything has always been in color. And so, uh, even though the show is still funny, I couldn't help but feel like there was something missing in the context of not being able to see the color. Uh, take, take just for example, the actress who plays Lucy, right? Lucille Ball, one of her uh, shining characteristics is her red hair. But you don't see that when you're watching this show in black and white. And I think this contrast then is not only true about TV, but also uh, when we see photos that are in black and white. Uh, kind of like a photo like this. So uh, this is a black and white photo of the stained glass of the chapel, uh, the, the window that sits above the altar in the chapel at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. And if you look at it there, you can kind of see a figure, and of course that's Jesus in the center, and you've got all this intimate detail. There's a dove descending and fire underneath him, and there's water, and there's lilies. There's even an angel playing the harp uh, in the upper corner. And I mean, when you're sitting there and you're facing the altar and looking up at this window, it's truly a beautiful sight to see. 
But having seen this window in color, seeing it in black and white, it just doesn't do it justice. It reminds me then of uh, this black and white concept and how things look a little bit more dull and a little dimmed. There's so much lost of the beauty of it that is seen when it's in color. And I couldn't help but see then that in a similar way, this is kind of what Jesus does for us. That Jesus takes the things that are perhaps dark and dull and he adds color, he adds beauty to them. He transforms the way that we see and experience all of our lives and he does this through grace. And this seems particularly true then in relation to the wilderness that we're journeying through today. Uh, see, over the past few weeks, right, we've been in our Lenten series, Journeys Through the Wilderness. And we've talked about the wilderness in the context of being a place of spiritual struggle and a place of spiritual renewal. And so we started with the wilderness of temptation, last week into the wilderness of uncertainty, and now we're right in the thick of the season of Lent, and thus getting a little deeper into the wilderness. This week, of course, going through the wilderness of discontent. Now, when I say uh, discontent, I don't want you to think just unhappy. Uh, I think that being unhappy is usually what comes to mind when we think of being discontent, but that's only really a piece of it. See, because I think generally speaking, oh, being unhappy is something that kind of comes and goes very quickly. Uh, for example, I've heard that when kids are unhappy, if you give them ice cream, things kind of go away. And I mean, that's true for some adults as well, but nonetheless, the unhappiness is easily removed, right? Or um, if you go to a restaurant and they give you the wrong order, you're probably unhappy about that, but most of the time you're just gonna eat it and it'll be okay and you'll move on. And maybe some of you are feeling unhappy because your March Madness bracket was busted after just one game, right? There's unhappiness there, but we get over it when we watch the next set of games. So yeah, generally speaking, being unhappy can be replaced with just taking the unhappy thing out and putting something happy in. But being discontent is a deeper feeling, right? Uh, discontentment is often more than just related to just one thing. It's usually kind of a complex set of emotions and feelings that we're often trying to explore what is really at the heart of our discontent. And thus one of the ways that we experience discontent in our lives is the way in which we see things, see the world around us, our experiences, and all of our lives. It dampens our perspective, the, the colorfulness of life, so to speak. There is beauty that is removed when we are living with discontented hearts. It removes the beauty of the grace of Jesus right before our very eyes. And this happens so often in our lives, it, it makes sense then that it's part of our story that you heard from the Gospel of John this morning. See, as the story opens up, uh, we are at the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus, whom Jesus has just recently resurrected from the dead. And so they're sitting there for a meal and enjoying this wonderful time. And while Martha is serving, Lazarus is sitting there, other people are gathered. Mary takes this oil, this specifically pure uh, ointment that would have been made up of a lot of different things that made it very aromatic. So the moment she opens it and starts anointing the feet of Jesus, everyone can tell what's going on. You can smell it in the air. And we see that, we hear this because Judas has a reaction. And Judas's reaction begins to show us the depth of his discontent. See, as Mary is anointing Jesus' feet, Judas speaks and he says, Why was this jar not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Uh, now, contextually speaking, this is kind of a fair question, right? Because it's a, it's a single denarius back then would have been one full day's worth of wages. So, kind of simple math here, if Mary would have sold this jar, or someone else would have sold it, and it would have gone for 300 denarius, like Judas claims, they would have made 300 days worth of wages in just one day. Right, so let's put that into perspective for us. Uh, if the average work week is about five days, and you work five days a week for the whole year, you've only worked 260 days. You need to add an extra two months to get to that 300. So it would be a year and two months worth of wages in one day. How many of you would really pass that offer up? Remember, God's watching. Keep your hands down. It's okay. But Judas makes this point, right? He wants people to think about this. Everyone at the table is now thinking about it, and it seems like a fair question. But as Scripture goes on, it gives us more detail about what's really happening here. Right? There's context to Judas' comment. First off, when we're introduced to Judas in the story, we're told that he is the one who would betray Jesus. 
Everyone else at the table didn't know that, of course, except for Jesus. So this detail is not for everyone sitting there, but we have it. And then, of course, after Judas speaks, when he asks that question, there's another detail added that the people at the table didn't know. Judas is not asking this question because he cares deeply about the poor. Judas is asking this question because he cares deeply about himself, specifically his pockets. See, Jesus was the collector of the money bag, which means he held on to all of the money that was received when the apostles traveled and everything like that. And what he did was he took a cut out of whatever was received and lined his own pockets. So basically, if they would have sold all that money, if they would have sold that ointment and received all that money, Judas would have had a nice healthy cut lining his pockets. And this is all provided by these intimate details, this context then, that speaks into what's really going on for Judas. Everyone around the table may be thinking he really cares about the poor, but Judas is only thinking about himself. Judas is being a hypocrite. And uh, uh, Pastor Mark has shared this before, that in the Greek language, hypocrite is another way of saying someone being a play actor. So Judas is play acting for the people there. He is saying one thing, doing something different, and it's right around the people that he supposedly cares for and loves. And it's in this context, then, that we see the depth of Judas's discontent. That it's, it seems like it's something on the surface, and yet it goes much deeper. And I think this is one of the ways that discontentment presents itself in our life as well. See, discontentment causes us to see everything as not giving us what we want, and therefore, we don't see the beauty in it. And this kind of starts with something like hypocrisy, with, with play acting. Right? In our world today, we, we usually say that hypocrisy is saying one thing but doing the opposite. And so, uh, I don't know where this may be happening in your life, but this is something that we kind of get caught up in pretty quickly, and we're then forced to deal with a really tough question. In the context of the Lenten season and this spiritual struggle, this wilderness that we find ourselves in, we have to ask a really tough question. Where are you lying to yourself? Uh, where are you saying one thing, but really you feel the opposite, and deep down you know that you do, but you're still acting a different way? Uh, where are you play acting in your life? Maybe it's at home, maybe it's at work, or school, or church, or a local community, or whatever the place may be. The reality is that if you are play acting, eventually over time, the pain of all the discontent will continue to weigh on you. And as that pain uh, weighs you down, you begin to deal and wrestle with your own contradiction. And they end up leaving you in a place of deep discontent. And as this carries on over time, you end up blaming everyone and everything around you for your own feelings. Maybe you end up blaming the people that you love, who care about you, because you don't see the ways that they care for you. Or uh, maybe you end up blaming just your circumstances because you're just not happy, but you're really not willing to share why you're not, and so you're discontent with the circumstances. And maybe if it's something that's even beyond your control, kind of like it was for Judas. This was Mary's gift that she delivered to Jesus, and yet Judas's discontentment is so deep that he can't even see that. And here's the thing. It's really hard to confess this feeling. It's really hard to confess this lie that we are lying to ourselves and the people that we love, the people around us. Because what gets so difficult then is so often we double down on the hypocrisy. We keep up the acting so much so that eventually we believe our own lies. And maybe what's even worse about this is that the devil knows this too. And that he preys on us the same way that he preys on Judas. Right, Judas blames and even attempts to shame Mary for this honorable thing that he did. And he covers his own discontent with this hypocrisy, with this lie about what he's really thinking, when really that's not the case. This discontent is so deeply rooted in Judas that he's just trapped in these feelings. And they expose themselves in these subtle comments in these subtle ways. In that same way, when we are trapped in our own hypocrisy and our lies, there's a feeling that there's no way out, that we, we can't escape the place that we put ourselves. We can't escape the discontent in our lives. But the story doesn't end there, right? Jesus has more to say about what's going on. 
Jesus speaks after Judas asks this question, and he points us towards something that reminds us of what to do when we're feeling discontent. See, Jesus opens his mouth. He says, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. When Jesus speaks, he opens up our eyes to see the beauty in what's happening. To see that as Mary is anointing his feet, this is a wonderful, honorable, respectable thing to do, and even foreshadows what he would do just a few days later. But Jesus explains that Mary didn't just have this oil for now, but for the day of his burial. What Jesus does here is he points everyone forward, you and me and everyone around that table, he points everyone to his death. And this must have been such a difficult thing because it's so subtle and yet it's so profound. Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead and now they're here eating and now he's pointing to his death. And even though Judas doesn't ultimately realize it and he stays trapped in those feelings, he's unable to see what Jesus is doing, we have the perspective where we can see what Jesus is up to. Jesus points us so clearly to this moment, to the moment where our eyes are opened and our lives are changed forever. He points to his death. He points to the cross, to the place where our sin and our shame, our hypocrisy and our lies, where all of it goes to die. All of those things die on the cross with Jesus, and therefore we are free to experience life in a new way. No longer trapped by the lies, Jesus sets us free and to live in light of grace. Because grace changes how we live. Grace changes how we see our lives, the people around us, the world in which we live. Grace invites us to experience a freedom like none other, a freedom from our sin. To live and therefore see life anew. Grace offers us the opportunity to be honest with one another, knowing that we've already received that grace. And in the context of our lives, uh, there are a few different ways that that we can live this out, that we can live in light of grace. And I just want to share just three simple ways that we can do this. The first one is to confess. You know, in the midst of the season of Lent, we always talk about how we are returning and repenting. This, this context of confessing our lies to God is to seek that forgiveness and grace, which he promises every time that we confess. The second thing that we can do is we can talk about it. Uh, talk specifically with trusted voices. Don't go post about it on Facebook or on Instagram. That's probably not going to help. And don't go to the source of your discontentedness because that may be a really difficult conversation, especially if it's someone that you really love. But even then, talk about it. Share your discontent with someone who will speak the truth in love because Christ calls us to be his body. And as the body of Christ, we are always met with grace. And the last thing that you can do is to pray about it. We see this all throughout Scripture. Uh, The prophets of old, the psalmists themselves, so many people crying out to God in the midst of their discontent, in the midst of their hurt, their pain, and all of it. And they take it to God in prayer, and God responds with His grace. As we pray about it, God reminds us, God reminds you that you are loved, that you receive His grace upon grace. You know, I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, one of the ways that this reality comes to the forefront of our lives is the way in which we see the world. That uh, the work that Jesus does is in, invites us to see life differently. It frees us up to see the beauty of the world that is around us. It's like adding color to a black and white photo. So when we're discontent with our lives, it often looks like this. That photo there, it, it's okay but there's so much more that we might want to see. And when Jesus frees us from our discontent, we literally see our lives differently. Grace causes us to see things differently. It looks more like this. See, uh, the beauty there is so clearly evident. The work of Jesus becomes so much more apparent that we can't help but be drawn to it. 
to be drawn to the work that he does in our lives, to be drawn to that grace that is there for me and for you because it's all about grace. See, church, as we journey through the wilderness of discontent in our lives, my hope in prayer is that together our eyes are open to see the world differently to see the work that Jesus does as he transforms our hearts and minds, to see things in light of grace. Because as we wrestle with our discontent, Jesus provides freedom, and it begins and ends with grace. And grace changes everything. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
as we close today. I invite you to join me in the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.